new series. I'm kind of excited. When we get these vinyls in, they're really, um, what's the word, wrinkly? So I googled, how do you get wrinkles out of vinyls? And someone wrote in, Botox. (laughs) I was like, okay, who thinks of things like that? Apparently not me. Okay, if you are new or you are joining us online, if you are watching us online and you want the handouts, you just need to go to connectwithfaith.com, and there's a little button there that says handouts, so you can get them from there. Okay, we have been working through the Gospel of Luke very slowly, we always say. We spent 10 weeks, someone was helping me this morning, they said, how long did we do the last series? 10 weeks. Oh my gosh, it was like the never-ending series. Anyway, we're finally past that. And we are on a series called Which Way? Because now there's going to be kind of a tide turning in Luke where Jesus is now going to start telling us more what it means to follow him. And now we're going to have a choice on which way that we want to go. So hence the name of what we're doing. Um, Quickly, schedule for Thanksgiving and Christmas. We do not meet the week of Thanksgiving and Christmas, um, or December, we always take off, but we're not this year. I think I told you that. So I will be here for the first three weeks in December. We're going to do a new series called The Equation for those three weeks, and then we'll come back in January. So come and hang out with us. We would love to have you. Okay, so we have been in Luke. We saw, you know, Jesus being born, uh, his, the way he healed people and and uh, cast out demons and did all those wonderful things. And now we're at a point where he's going to start showing us and, and he's going to start teaching people what, what it means to, to choose, to choose certain ways on, on, and when you follow him. So I was thinking about, a, um, I read an article about three guys that were in Death Valley. They went in their, their car and somehow their car broke down and they decided to walk out and all three of them died. One died like five miles, seven miles, 15 miles, or whatever it was. And when the officer found them, he said, the problem is they just went the wrong way. Like, had they gone one mile this way, there was a spring and water and they would have been saved. But because they went the other way, they all died. And so we have to make choices in our lives. And and as a follower of Christ, we're going to find out that there's always going to be two directions. And so today I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about, before we even head into the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll start in next week, but I want to talk about what do we do as followers of Christ as far as how do we make good choices? Because there is kind of a pattern that the Bible gives us, so I want to talk about that today. And I also want to encourage you, if you are here and you've made bad choices and you're suffering the repercussions from that, I want to give you encouragement and hope and let you know that, that that's okay. It doesn't disqualify you from anything. And so that's where we're going with today. Now, the Bible gives us two choices that we have to make, or, or that we, we make. And they're big choices. Like we choose, do we want to go to heaven or do we want to go to hell? I mean, those are big choices that we have to make. Are we going to make wise decisions or are we going to make foolish decisions? Do we love people or are we going to hate people? Do we want to serve God or do we want to serve Satan? Do we want to be blessed or do we want to be cursed? So you see, all through the Bible, there's all these choices, and you and I, and God gives us such a free will to be able to make these choices. Now, I have this little thing when we were doing this. I've got to figure out which one. I'll start over here first. David, I'm stressing you out, I know. Um, Rob and I were talking about all the different choices that we can make in life, and these are some of them. You can decide if you want to be a waitress, okay, and especially one on roller skates, which would not work for me. I did not practice this, by the way. So, um, teacher, you can be a teacher, so you can be either a teacher or a roller skate person, okay? This was me last week. You can scream and yell at somebody if you want. That's our choice. Or we can talk on the phone nicely, okay? I actually yelled at somebody on the phone last week. I told you about that. So anyway, all through life, we have choices like that. Now, we have really cooler choices over here. Over here, we can choose to sit on the couch and watch TV and just kind of be a bum. It's probably a picture. She's probably sick. I probably feel guilty that I just said that. Or we can see that there's a really big world out there with hurting people that are homeless, and, and we can go make a choice to go help them. Oh, see, I told you, I never practiced this. Okay, here's my favorite one. 
Okay, fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Hence all of the Tootsie Rolls on your table today. So those are always my choices. And of course, when Rob and I were trying to pick out these pictures, I said, we got to find a picture of an M&M. So we were going through the pictures and he, um, and then I get up and he goes, where are you going? I said, hang on a second. So I go in the house and I grabbed a whole handful of M&Ms and I brought it out and ate them and said, I got to feel this lesson somehow. <laughs> So that's what we have to do. But all of our life is filled with choices. And God says, I have really good ways for you to make really good choices. And I know I put certain things on the good side. It doesn't matter. You can be a waitress or you can be, a, it doesn't, those things don't really matter. But let's talk about Moses real quick because he's going to give us a really good idea of, of how to make good decisions. If you look in your handout, Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, we'll start there. This is when Moses is going through the 40 years in the wilderness and they're going on their way to the promised land because they've been stuck in Egypt. Now they're, they're wandering around in the desert forever, it seems. And right before they get into the promised land, Moses decides to give them a sermon. And he wants to tell them something really, really important because for the last 40 years, all they've done is trust in God. God provided that their shoes never wore out. He provided manna for them. He provided water. So he was their provision. But Moses knew that the minute they got into another place, that now they had choices. Like now you're going to have big choices to make. And, and Moses wanted them to know, I want you to choose the right thing. So this is what he says in verse 15. See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land into which you shall go. So the first thing he tells people is here's your choice. When you get there, your choice is to continually love God and to keep his commandments and walk in his ways because if you do those things, then I can bless you. I can't bless you if you're going to go out and do stupid stuff. It's just not what, what he does. And the problem is when, when we hear about the commandments or the Ten Commandments or whatever, we think, okay, A, that's boring. I don't want anyone telling me what to do because we kind of have those that we're kind of bent that way. And, and yet he's saying that to live a blessed life, and for me, my blessed life means I have peace, I have joy, I can go through anything and know God's in control, I trust him with everything, I, I just have peace, I go through life like that. But some people go through life in turmoil and they're scared and they're frightened and they're fearful and that's just their life. And he's saying, I don't want you to go through it like that. So let's talk about what he, he says on some of these commands. Now, for those of you that think that God's commands are burdensome and he's just out there to try to make your life miserable. I'm going to go through a few of them. Now, if you see that little thing with the tablets on there on your handout, you've seen them. This is the third time. We've never gotten to it for some reason. Like they've always been at the end of the lesson. So either I have Alzheimer's strong possibility and we have already done this, but I don't think we did because when I don't, we move it to another section, but who knows? We're doing it again. So if, we, if you've heard it once, sorry, but I don't think we did. Anyway, he talks about, let's talk about some of the things that he says. He says, first of all, don't have any other gods before me. And you're like, why? When I go into this new nation and I'm free to do whatever I want, why not? And he's saying, because I am the only way you are going to spend eternity in heaven. I'm the only source of eternal life. Now, if you go and follow other gods, you're not going to have that. And if you put it in perspective like that, you're like, oh, well, then I guess he does really love me. He does care about who I am following. Uh, he, the second thing he says is don't have any idols. Now, back then they were little, you know, they were little idols that people worshipped and they, um, they made them their gods and, and they bowed down to them and to sacrifice to them and did weird stuff. But for us, our idols today could be different things like our husband, our children, our jobs, our sports, our hobbies. I mean, we could have one of many idols in our life today. And so when we sit, when God says, don't have any idols, we go, well, why not? Why wouldn't you want me to? And I started thinking about that this week because if your kids are your idols, they're going to move out. Trust me. They're going to get married and their wives will now basically 
tell them what to do or their husbands. Well, that's just what happens. They're not going to listen to us anymore. So you say, hey, I think this is a good idea. And they're like, yeah, my wife doesn't really think that. So I'm like, okay. So if you put all your stock into your kids, they're going to disappoint you. Just plan on that. Let's say you love sports and your favorite team is the Cardinals whatever. Um, But they're going to have a bad season, and then you're going to be sad every time they lose, and you're going to be disappointed. Um, Let's say you work, and you have this job, and you're like, everyone loves me, and you got this big account, and then and then you lose the account, and now everyone's mad at you. And it's just, if, if you put your stock in your work, then God's saying, that's never going to satisfy you. Um, how about your um, hobbies? I have no idea what I was saying about hobbies. Hobbies come and go. You, who's, uh, Heather is Heather. She's so cute. She's going to run, and she's going to do the um, Grand Canyon. And, it's the, and I'm, you're my hero, because I, I couldn't run from here to there. <laughs> but it's amazing because as fun as that is, like once you're done with it, it's like you check it off your list and you're like, okay, but what next? You know, you'll probably like climb the Himalayas or something. <laughs> but that's just life. I mean, we kind of just do one thing and then we go to the next and God's saying, it's great for the moment, but eventually you need something that's going to be a lot more solid. And he's saying, that's going to be me. I'm going to be the solid one in your life that will always be there for you. I will never change. I'm what you need. You're like, okay, well, then that makes sense. Uh, The next one he says is honor your father and mother. Now, for me, that's easy. I have a great mom and dad, so that's really simple. But for you, you may have had a really horrible child life, and your parents cut you down all the time, and they mistreated you, and they abused you. And you're like, why would I have to honor my mom and dad? They did nothing for me except ruin my life, which is probably true in a world sense. But if they treated you that bad, then I'm going to assume that they need Jesus, that they really, really have a lot of issues in their life for them to have turned on you and done what they did to you. So God comes in and says, I want you to honor your father and mother. And you're like, why would I do that? Because you may be the only Jesus that they ever see. And if that's the case, think of the privilege that you're going to have to share Jesus with them because they're going to be able to see how much you love and care for them even though they hurt you in their past. And so when you, when you see that, you're like, okay, God, well, then that, that makes sense. Um, then he says, don't kill. Okay, and I, this makes sense to me because if anybody here looks good in orange go for it, okay? The, the prison colors in Phoenix are orange, okay? I, I think that was God's greatest gift. I look horrible in orange, so I, I, I don't want to go to prison and have to wear orange every single day. So I think that makes total sense. Don't lie. He says, don't lie. Why? Have you ever lied to someone? Now you're stressed. Did I say that? Did I not say that? So all of these things God's saying, I just want you to do the right thing. Don't have an affair, Every person here has been touched. Whether you had an affair, your husband had an affair, someone in your life did, and you have seen the devastation that just has swept through your family or the family because of adultery. And so you know the devastation it leaves, and God's saying, don't do it because I want you to live this blessed life, and you can't live it if you're doing stuff that I've asked you not to do. So when we start looking at at God's commands as a good thing and as protection, then it moves us forward in life saying, okay, I want to serve him because he loves me and has my best interests. Now, Moses is getting ready to tell the people um, that, that their choice is to love God, and then look at what he says um, that their other choice is, verse 17. But if your mind and heart turn away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to, you, declare to you today that you shall surely perish and you shall not live long in the land which you pass over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you that I have set before you life and death, the blessings and the curses. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live and may, and, and may love the Lord your God, obey his voice and cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's saying, Moses is right off the bat saying, you guys will have a choice when you get there and here's your choices. Love God or don't and the consequences are going to be really two completely different um, consequences. Now, on your, uh, in front of your chair, you have a 
uh, magnet. It's a refrigerator magnet and it has a verse on it, it, this Deuteronomy verse that says, choose this day. And originally I wanted to do playing cards because I had this idea. I thought, okay, we're kind of like in this game of life and during this game, you know, we're going to have to make choices. So I thought, okay, we'll do a thing of playing cards. And that way when you play like go fish with your grandkids or your kids, they'll be like, oh, what's that verse? And then it's a great playing or teaching moment. So I had this whole thing planned out. So I called the girl who does our graphic design and I was telling her what I wanted. And, and I said, so I want this, what you have there on playing cards. And she said, oh, you can't do that. That's illegal. And I said, what? I go, I found all these places that will do it. And she says, no, no, no. She goes, I'm a pastor's kid. She said, they told me that playing cards were illegal. <laughs> like, you couldn't play playing cards w- in the church that she grew up with. And I was like, oh, that is like so incredibly sad. So I came home and told Rob, and then he, so he, we nixed the playing card in case anyone here grew up like that, which you, I promise you, you can play cards. The Bible doesn't say you can't, but there are some people that that would stress out. So Rob didn't want to stress anyone out. So we nixed the playing cards, and I started thinking about it afterwards. I thought, wouldn't it be sad if you were here going, I really needed some playing cards. It's kind of like telling you like, hey, I was going to make you some brownies today, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah, so I hate it when people do that. But anyway, instead you have a refrigerator magnet. So it's on your kitchen refrigerator. And whenever you walk by and you're thinking of kicking the dog or hitting your husband or yelling at your kids, now you'll see right up there, okay, which way am I going to go? I got to make a choice here. So see, they're good reminders. Okay, so I want to talk today about how to make good choices that will affect your future because we see that every person um, has these two different paths that they can go on. In the 1800s, there was a man by the name of Edwin Thomas, and he was an actor. He was a very, very well-renowned actor. And at 15, he starred in Richard III, and in New York, he performed Hamlet 100 nights consecutively. Now, he had a younger brother. His name was John, and John and Edwin decided to unite one time and do, uh, what was the name of the play? Julius Caesar. So John, his brother, played the part of Brutus, the assassin, and Edwin played the other part. But what it did is it foreshadowed because two years later, John would go into Ford's theater and become an assassin to President Lincoln. And Edwin was like so just didn't even know what to do. He, he said, I'll never get my career back. I'll, I just, he was so ashamed by what his brother killing the president. So one night he was at a train station and the crowds were pushing and some man that was well dressed who had gotten pushed onto the tracks. And so Edwin jumped down and grabbed him and saved him. And when they got back up on the platform, Edwin looked, or the man looked at him and said, I know you, you're the actor. The, and, and yeah, yeah, whatever. So th- he didn't know. Three weeks later, he got a letter from Ulyss- Ulysses Grant saying, thank you for saving the life of Robert Todd Lincoln, um, President Lincoln's son. And I thought that was so interesting. Here you've got two kids, and one is into saving lives, and one is into taking lives. And yet we see it all through the Bible. You see Cain and Abel. You see, you know, Abel chooses God, Cain chooses murder. Abraham and Lot. You've got Abraham that says, I just want to do what God wants. Lot, on the other hand, is like, yeah, I just kind of want Sodom and the party and all that kind of stuff. David and Saul, both kings. David chooses God, Saul chooses power. Peter and Judas. Peter chooses Jesus. Judas chooses death. Okay, so on every page we see that there's choices that you and I are going to make and they are going to affect our future. So I want to talk first about what it means to choose. So I have a definition there. I think it's in your, your handout. To choose means to pick out or select someone or something as being the best or most appropriate of two or more alternatives. So I want to start today and talk about what does the Bible say about making choices? How do we make good biblical choices? And we're going to start with Proverbs 3, 5. And the problem with Proverbs 3, 5 is it's kind of like the 1 Corinthians 13 last week. It's been so overused. We can say it. We can recite it. You probably even know it by memory. And it's one of those things you just kind of hear it like, um, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. You're like, okay, whatever. But I think in that verse is the key to make making good choices, and that is don't trust our own understanding and trust the Lord. And that's hard because my problem is I think if, I, if a thought comes in my brain, I think it's a really good thought and I think it's from God. 
Now, this just happened this last week. I lean on my own understanding. Actually, it happened not this last week, a couple of weeks ago. I had this idea because we had this wave of people that were Facebooking me about, I'm depressed, I'm sad, I, I'm, you know, I need to go on medicine, my life, everything. But it was such a wave, I didn't even know what to do. So we were just sending out books right and left because I'm like, we've got to get people to be encouraged and that was what we wanted to do. But I, I, I was driving along and I thought, we need to bring in a Christian speaker that, that knows all about depression. So someone clicked in my brain. I had this brilliant idea. In 30 seconds, I had this whole women's conference planned. Okay, it's planned. We're ready to go for it. I go home that night. I'm like, Rob, I've got the coolest idea. What do you think about this? He's like, yes, let's do it. Okay, now this is somebody that's very well known and would be really easy to find. I could not find her anywhere. Like I would Google, I would get on her website, website down. I would go, how do I get a hold of this? What? Nobody. And finally it dawned on me, I said, is this my idea with my own understanding or is this really God's idea? And so finally I had to go, all right, I give. God, if this is not of you, I clearly don't want to do this. So you need to open and shut the doors. But it was a great reminder to me that we can think something is right just because it's in our mind and we think that God put it there. But sometimes our mind, we just think things. I mean, God did give us a mind. doesn't mean everything is of him. So um, the second part of making good decisions is found in Psalms 1. Because all the time when you're getting ready to do something, you are going to want to get advice from somebody, okay? And the problem is, is that when you and I want to do something, we, if we have 10 friends, we know who's going to say, yeah, go for it, and who's not going to say that. So look at Psalms 1. Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable is the man who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, following their advice, their plans and purposes, nor stands a submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk, nor sits down to relax and rest where the scornful and the mockers gather. So when you and I are getting at that point, like it's like, oh my gosh, I got this big decision to make. What am I going to do? Who are you going to listen to? Are you going to turn on the TV? Are we going to listen to Oprah or get Dalai Lama or Deepak Chopra or whatever his name is, where are we going to get our, our, our counsel from? And we have to remember that if you want to go and have an affair, you have a choice. Like you have, if I, I've got five friends, it, well, hopefully I have more than five. Maybe I only have two. I don't know. But let's say I have five friends and, you know, if one of them's a non-believer and I know she's had three affairs, if I want to have an affair and I want someone to tell me it's okay, I can go to her. Not you. <laughs> I did point at you, but that's not... I love you, by the way. Um, but so you can always find somebody that will tell you what you want to hear. And the Bible is very clear. Go to someone who knows God's word really well that can give you the kind of answer that, that, that he wants you to have, not that you want. Uh, verse 2, but his delight, so the person that you're going to listen to, and desire are in the law of the Lord, and on his law, the precepts, the instructions, and the teachings of God, he habitually meditates, ponders, and studies by day and by night, which is a great verse for us to say, you know what, we need to be that person. We need to be the person that, that are habitually studying and meditating on God's word so that people can come to us and say, what do you think I should do about that? And now we are the ones that have, that's why we do this study, so we can learn so that we can now impart to other people's lives. So the next question to ask yourself in making a good choice is, is what I'm about to do, does it violate anything God has already said? Okay, because God has stated a whole lot of things in his word, and we need to know what exactly he says first. So here's a couple um, questions. Should I marry this non-Christian? He's clearly not a Christian, but Lisa, you don't understand. He's this close to coming to Christ. And my thing is, if he's this close, once you marry him, he's this close, okay? Because he's, that's just how guys are. They're like, they'll do just enough to get you to marry him, and then they're like, I want nothing to do with God. Right now, he's just putting on a show, so just plan on that, okay? But... God has spoken on that. He's saying, do not be unequally yoked. And unequally yoked means don't marry someone who isn't a follower of Jesus. And I don't even mean like follower in name only, like, oh yeah, I signed up for Jesus thing, 
250 years ago. No. Does he really honestly love Jesus to where he's going to lead you and, and you guys can work together? And, and if not, then my suggestion is God has already spoken. Homosexuality is a huge thing. And you're going to have to deal with this. Maybe you, maybe your kids, grandkids, who knows. But God has spoken on that. And if you're here going, but I just don't really like the opposite sex and I'm just kind of confused and I see all these shows now telling me it's okay and I want you to know that God has already spoken on that. And because he has, it's 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. If you want to know that, um, that's where you can go to find that it's not in your handout or anything. But anyway, he has spoken on that. Should I get a divorce? What does the Bible say? Is it a biblical divorce? There are two biblical divorces. One is do not let, uh, if your unbelieving spouse walks out on you. The other one is if your spouse has committed adultery. Other than that, you got to do everything you can to work it, work it out. Unless, of course, there's abuse. And then, of course, you know, God, you need to separate and do those kind of things. But God has spoken on those things. You don't just walk out on your marriage because you're like, I just don't like my husband anymore. Well, I don't think you have that option because God has already spoken on it. Should I forgive that person? He's spoken. Should I cheat at work? He's spoken. Um, so that's why we need to know what the Bible says. Okay, the other thing um, is... and is do you have peace? And I, I'm saying that and I'm hesitating because this morning, Rob and I yesterday decided we wanted to do something. And I woke up at 2 o'clock this morning and suddenly I have no peace over it. And I woke up and I said, I'm not comfortable with that right now. I don't think we should do that right now. And it was just weird, but it was a reminder to me that God is not the author of confusion. And when you're making a decision, you need to pray, God, give me peace. Philippians 4, 7, he says, and the peace of God which surpasses all our comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So if you don't have peace, take that as a sign from God to say, wait, it doesn't mean it never will happen. It just means it's not going to happen right now until you feel completely peaceful about it. Now, I want to talk about our conscience, too, in making decisions. And I want to talk about David. Because I want to give you a biblical example of how when you and I, we, you know, we just our conscience doesn't feel right about doing something. Even though it seems like it's a good deal, sometimes God just makes things not feel right within us. Um, here's a First Samuel 24. This is when Saul is king. And David, God told David that he would be king at some point. And, um, but Saul hates David, so Saul is out trying to kill David, and now he's got him in this cave, and I'll show you what happens here. Uh, 1 Samuel 24, verse 1. Now when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. A little overkill, I would say. He came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Do you love the Bible? It's like Saul went into like the porta potty. I mean, it's in the cave, okay? <laughs> You're just like, wow, but it really does honestly say that. Now, David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. So you see this big scene where, where you know, you see Saul in his kingly robes, and he walks into this cave to go to the bathroom, and he turns around, but he doesn't realize David's in that cave in the background. And so he's hiding in the back, and he doesn't really know what to do. And verse 4, he says, The men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I'm about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. So David arose, cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly, and it came about afterwards that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. Now, He's even got friends in the cave with them that are telling him, quoting scripture basically, God said that you're going to be um, king someday. Go for it. Do what God's telling you to do. And yet, David's conscience says, nope, I cannot do that. It's just not right. So when, when you have a decision to make, and, and even if someone, and this is where godly friends are great, but always, always, if you have a really good relationship with God, go with what your gut is telling you. And this is a great reminder of that. Stephen Furtick is a pastor in Elevation Church, and, and I think it's North Carolina. He's getting ready to, to start this big church, and he went to a different church service, and a lady prophesied over him and said, God does not want you to start this church. It will fail. And he's like, serious? Like, that's not what God told me. And he went, and it's one of the largest growing churches in, in North Carolina now. And, and 
tons of people coming to Christ. So sometimes, because we're human, we can get it wrong, just so you know that. So go with your gut on, on things like that, because we know Proverbs 21.1 says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as are the water courses, he turns it whichever way, whichever way he wills. So if we're seeking God, God is really great at turning people's hearts to where he needs them to go. Rob and I were talking about this um, Saturday. We were sitting in the back, and, and he, I don't know what we were talking about, and we were planning on doing something, and then he came and said, I just don't feel like we should do that anymore. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah, I just, I don't know, God just changed my heart. And we started thinking about it and talking how interesting it is that for 10 years, Rob has been talking about doing this, and in one day, he's like, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. I just don't think that's a good idea. It was so cool. It's just a reminder that God changes hearts because that's what he's in the job. Our job is to seek him. God, what do you want me to do? If you don't want me to do this, change me, change my husband, change. Rob and I just did, did that this morning. Um, I walked out and said, hey, Dusty wants to do this one thing. And Rob's like, nah, I don't really think so. I'm like, okay. Went in. I said, God, would you just change his heart? Like, and w- honestly, within 15 minutes, hey, you know what we were talking about? I think we'll do it now. I think we'll do what Dusty wants to do. So I'm like, okay, perfect. So instead of fighting with your husband, your best bet, honestly, is just pray. God, change his heart, and it really does work. So anyway, so now he's in the back of the cave, and look what verse 6 says. So he said to his men, so David says to his men, far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. David pursued his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul, and Saul arose, left the cave, and went on his way. So David learned to listen to that inner voice of him because I cannot imagine what David's life would be like had he gone ahead and killed Saul before the time was for him to, for, for God to come through. Because he, he needed to wait for God's timing. And sometimes when you and I as women, we want things now, 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 which I get that. And we talk to our husbands or, or whatever we need and we want an answer. But God sometimes says, you know what? I'm going to give you the answer, but it's going to be on my perfect timing. Don't do things ahead of time. Because a lot of times when we do that, it, it just kind of ruins it for us and for the other person too. So, uh, there's a verse in there, but we don't have time to go for it. They need this room, like, right at 10 o'clock, just an FYI. So, as soon as we're done here, like, we're going to jump up. If you can grab stuff and throw it out there. I don't know. Um, But we have to open that because their thing starts at 10. So, I'm going to hurry and get through this really fast. So, anyway, here's what we need to do so far. Seek God. Get godly counsel. Don't do anything he's prohibited in Scripture. Make sure your conscience is clear and you have peace. Now, there will always be decisions that, that aren't in the scripture, and you're going to have to pray about those things like, I got a job offer in Hawaii. Should I take it? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm choosing between two colleges, one on the beach, one on the desert. Beach. Absolutely. Here's, here's one. I'm thinking of marrying this certain person, and he is a believer, so there's no violation. And then you add a but but there's just something about it. Okay, so you, you have a, a, a okay, God's saying it's okay to marry this person, but now you've got to go further and say, I'm going to pray about things like that. Adopting, fostering children, I don't know. That's something you've got to, there's no biblical grounds for that, but those are choices that you have to make. So that just takes prayer and seeking counsel. And here's something to think about too. A lot of times we can overthink this stuff. Should I do it? Should I not? I'm so confused. What do I do? If you really feel like God's leading you to do something and there's peace, go for it. Step out. We would not be doing what we're doing today if, if, I had, if we didn't step out because there were times when I was just like, Rob, this just isn't going to work. And he's like, Lisa, we believe this is where God's calling us we're going to step out. And so I'm thankful that, that we did. Otherwise, God, we, we don't do what he wants us to do. Now, when we're making decisions, here's another thing to think about. Do we make decisions in, in light of eternity? And think about that. Is the decision that you're going to make going to affect the lives of you and your children and your grandchildren and the, those around you for eternity? Will it help further the gospel? Will it help your kids to know Jesus better. Um, The other thing is, how do I want to be remembered to my children and to my grandchildren? Do do I want um, 
do I want them to remember me as the grandma that like had an affair, or the grandma that lied, or the grandma, I mean, what, what do I want to be remembered as? And so when we make choices based on that, will it further the, the God's kingdom? Now, I want to end today talking to those of you that had those forks in the road and you actually um, took the wrong one. And maybe I say the guy was way too hot way back then and you just were like, I couldn't resist and we are now together. Maybe you're here and you're like, if I would have kept that pregnancy, then I wouldn't have had my career. Or maybe the money was so good, even though it was probably not the best, you know, career choice, but I couldn't turn it down. And so you married the hot guy, and then he started abusing you, and then you had an abortion, and then you worked as a stripper. Okay, so if that's your story, or anything like that, I want you to say that, I wanted to say that a lot of times people do make choices that will affect their future, but then they get this feeling like, God can never use me. And I just want you to know that's not true. I, I look back at all of the things in the Bible. The, the Bible's filled with stories, God's story of people that, like, look at Noah. Noah, God wipes off the whole world, and here's Noah and his family, and then he goes and gets drunk and naked, and he's just kind of being goofy. And yet, when he did that, God didn't say, well, flooding the world again, getting rid of the last 10 people or however many are left here. Not gonna, he didn't do that. No, I'm going to work with you. I love you, Noah. We're going to build something together. Yeah, you, you did something stupid, but we can get by that. How about uh, Abraham? Abraham, Abraham, you're going to be the father of a nation. And he goes and he lies, puts his wife pretty much in a harem in Egypt, it really could hurt her badly, and, and God has to come in and save the day. And yet he never said, you know what? See those stars? I'm going to darken them all because you're absolutely not going to be the father of this nation anymore because you didn't do what I asked. People are people. We've got to remember that. And, they, and we make goofy mistakes. David has an affair, kills his girlfriend's husband, and yet God still says, he's a man after my own heart. You're like, serious? But that's how redeeming God is. Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. Je or Peter denies Jesus. So we see all through the Bible of all of these situations that, that they made decisions way back here, and yet God redeemed those decisions and made them be able to follow Christ and do things for him regardless of the situation. Look at Psalms 86.15. He says, But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy and loving kindness and truth. Now, that's the God we serve. He's abounding in loving kindness. He's abounding in, he's going to take whatever and redeem your past. The problem is, is that you and I have consequences when we do stupid stuff. We just do. Um, if you get caught stealing at work, you're going to get fired. If I speed, I'm going to get a ticket. If you had that abortion, you feel guilty. If you, um, you name it, whatever you can put in, fill in the blank for you. But what I'm saying is that whatever you did in your past, God wants you to take it and say, you know what, that is my past, okay? It's gone. It's wiped away. And now I want to take what you learned from your past, and I want you to go help someone else. If you married that hot guy that abused you, then go work at a place where women are abused. And you can pour your life into these women and help them and say, look, I know what you're going through, and I want to help you with that. Um, if you had an abortion, oh my gosh, go work at Crisis Pregnancy Center, because there you're going to be able to tell girls coming in, look, I know what it's like. I don't want you to go through what I have spent years and years going through. And, and so now you're taking your story, and God's letting you use your story to redeem this situation to help somebody else. Because I think that the whole stripper part too. It's funny. I was just talking to a lady the other day who actually used to be a stripper and God saved her. She's the most amazing testimony. But I was thinking that that's what God does. He takes something that's really, not really good and, and Satan wants to keep you there. He wants you to, to always feel guilty and always feel bad, and always feel weighed down. And God's going, I don't want, that's not who I am. I'm going to redeem this situation so that we can move forward from here. I always say, like, if you, if you have a, a book and your life is filled with a book, I thought about this the other day, 
And now today you're on page 385 of your story, okay? Today's a new day. If you had a really bad past, take a match, light it to the back of that book, forget those past 300 and some odd pages, okay? Start today. Look at Lamentations 322. The Lord's loving kindness never ceases for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Because the problem is Satan wants to keep you in this box of guilt and shame and God can never use me and I'm worthless and I'm nothing. And, and Satan would love you to be there. Because if you get out of that box, then you can actually do something and serve Jesus and people can come to know him. And Satan wants you to be back here. Take that box, light a match to that thing too, let it go up in smoke, and, and get out of that box because otherwise you'll be too paralyzed to do anything for God. And God does not want you to be like that. So take your story of your wrong path that you went on and use it to serve God in the future. 